Right. Tell us this story, because it's sort of almost unbelievable that you had this unused or underused coal mine, and it turns out it may be worth a fortune. Well, it's, it's I describe it as kind of a 10-year overnight sensation. <laughs> uh, you know, we bought an old coal mine sight unseen for a modest amount of money about 12 years ago, and uh, we tried to develop it as a thermal mine, uh, which made no sense. Uh, so we pivoted into essentially trying to find out what else could you use coal for? And that took us into an odyssey of essentially trying to develop and use coal as a precursor to make alternative carbon products. And that led us in, in turn to work with some of the national labs, uh, in particular NETL, which is the National Energy Technology Lab. They were the ones that then asked us for some samples of the, uh, the cores from the property and uh, came back to us after about a year and a half of uh, analyzing them and said, uh, we think we found something rather interesting we need to talk about. And uh, that's the story as it uh, began, and that's where we are today. And that gets you to the rare earth elements, as I understand Correct. it, which we need so badly as we make this climate transformation. But in the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal report on this, it said it was uh, about $2 million and we were $37 billion, something like that. Where does a number like that come from? Is that a real number, $37 billion? So the, 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 did, first of all, the number didn't come from us. Uh, but I think the number was derived by essentially, you know, just taking the amount of tonnage we have and multiplying it by sort of a basket price of all the REs that we have. And we have, you know, a lot of the heavier uh, magnetic elements as well as the secondary elements and as well as two of the... Uh, the critical minerals that have recently been banned by China, which is gallium and germanium. Um, so it does contain a, a basket of rather valuable uh, elements. Uh, and forgive me if this is an ignorant question, but I was always under the impression that we kind of knew that a lot of this stuff was sitting under U.S. soil to some degree mm -hmm. or another. It was just a matter of whether we had, A, the capability to mine it, and more importantly, whether regulations would allow it. That in part is true. I think uh -huh. there are rare earth deposits in many places. Mm -hmm. The real trick is the concentrations of those mm -hmm. and then how they can be economically extracted and separated to actually create the product that can then be used to make magnets and electronics, et cetera. So that has been the challenge to really try to find where you had sufficient concentrations. Mm -hmm. um, they are formed, interestingly, by essentially volcanic activity and come from the earth magma mm -hmm. in various uh, in manners. And so the NETL has done an assessment throughout the country as to where they might be found. And because of the volcanic activity that's sort of in the Powder River Basin in northern Wyoming, that's a particularly fertile spot for rare earths. Mm -hmm. uh, they're found in other parts of the country, but not in much concentration. So that's why our property seems to be rather unique. So what's next? I mean, how do you sort of, I guess, scale up to whatever the final product is going to be? So it's a process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, finding it is, is, is one effort. Uh, finding it and then involves doing a lot of subsequent chemical testing uh, to essentially determine how you can separate and extract this. Because rare earths are measured in parts per million. So, you know, we're used to looking at coal seams that might be as tall as this room. Uh, here you're dealing with an area where you might have a mile's worth of cubic material and in it is contained rare earths in parts per million. So the trick is to be able to economically separate that. And that's, that's the quest that we're on right now, working with a number of the national labs as well to determine what's the most economic uh, way to extract. Do you have a sense, Randall, of the likelihood of being able to deliver? I mean, I noticed, for example, your largest shareholder, Yorktown, has mm -hmm. actually sold some shares mm -hmm. this fall. And that right. sort of surprised me, given this sort of phenomenon. Why would that be? Well, to answer the, the, the second question first, Yorktown, which is our largest shareholder, basically invested in us through a legacy fund that's now about 12 years old. So they're in the process of liquidating that fund, and they have sort of a set pattern to, uh, to distribute and sell shares. So that's the timing on that one. Um, and as to the first part of your question, you know, this process will take some time to, to ultimately uh, come to the point of the first commercial of the of the products, um, but we anticipate probably within the next 12 to 24 months being in a pretty good position to analyze exactly 
which extraction techniques may be the right one to deploy. So, Randall, my understanding is you didn't go into this as a rare earths element expert. That's not, that, that's not how you got here. But you've probably learned an awful lot since, as a result of this process. Does your experience that you've had so far say anything to our strategic position as the United States in having rare earth metals? Picks up on Romaine's question, actually, because we've been very concerned about that, particularly mm -hmm. with respect to China and how many they have. So. From our background, we are not obviously geologists in the rare earth space by training. So we relied sort of on the opinions of NETL. They regard this as probably one of, if not the most unique deposit they found in the continental US. And so we're kind of approaching this as a almost Team USA exercise where this could be a, a mine that could perhaps one day supply a meaningful amount of the supplies that this country needs and frankly do so by having it processed in sort of a mine to magnets area right there in Wyoming. Now, every time we bring a company founder or CEO on, and particularly this year, I should say, we have to ask them about any sort of link to artificial intelligence, as I'm sure you know that's all the rage. <laughs> but I'm told from David prior to this that apparently there is an AI component to this. There is. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, we yeah. started it this week, uh, which is a project that we've got with NETL where we're doing AI machine learning to basically help determine and assess rare earth compositions within coal. Wow. And it's a, it's a machine that looks like a ray gun and uh, that can detect elements and we're trying to basically use AI to refine how that can be used to really uh, skip a few steps mm -hmm. that might otherwise be used in chemical analysis. Are you expecting the usefulness of that technology to accelerate, meaning as we learn more about AI and learn more about its applications, that that will feed in to specifically I, what you do? I think you're absolutely yeah. right. Yep, yeah, it will. Let me go back to your original purpose, mm -hmm. uh, coal, and particularly metallurgical coal, as I understand. That's mm -hmm. what you really are involved in. Mm -hmm. There's a good press for now for so-called green steel. Mm -hmm. What do you look at as the potential for metallurgical coal, mm -hmm. the demand for steel, and green steel? How do those all interact? So as far as green steel, you know, the, most of the commentary on that revolves around the use of hydrogen as a substitute for blast furnace steel uh, in some manner where coal is substituted for hydrogen. We've looked at that. Um, th the best advice we have been given is that it would probably take some time between now and 2035 to 40 to create a pilot plant to use hydrogen at a cost of about a trillion and a half dollars. So we do not lose a lot of sleep on um, that particular alternative use. Although I think you know there are certain abatement techniques that can be used in steel plants which can certainly uh, you know, as I say, abate whatever emissions that are going on there. Yeah. But um, really, when I look at Met, school, Met Steel and Rare Earth, they're both part of what I would call critical materials mm -hmm. because steel is now being, you know, used as a critical material behind most of the energy transition right. that we think about in, uh, in windmills and solar.